And it's a strong push tonight for President Akufuado to declare a state of emergency on endangered water bodies and rivers and the siege from illegal mining companies. Well, the Ghana Water Company, we've heard them issue a warning of halting um, production due to significant disruption of illegal mining activities and attacks on its staff by perpetrators. Well, the situation is already dire with water generation already dropping from 70 to 40 percent nationwide. Already we are hearing also that activities are now affecting the Dainsu River, which is the main source of production for the Ghana Water Company Limited. Residents in these communities are in a state of despair following the damage done to their livelihoods. When the mining was not done in the Pra River, we were using it to do all our chores, including drinking it. All we needed to do was to put in Kanfa. We were using it to cook and wash. Everything has been destroyed now. In the beginning of August, we saw some Chinese people working outside the forest uh, reserve. They crossed the Tano River into the forest to do illegal mining. The forestry people, in, after two weeks, the forestry people came to drove them away but they left their machines on the road well we've been hearing from the lands and natural resources minister samuel abujinapo he was on the super morning show today and he served notice of a major crackdown on galamsey hotspots following the disruption in water supply especially in the ashanti and central regions we are going to re we are going to have the review today and i'm 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 a thousand percent certain and i can give you the firm assurance that we're going to deploy, we're going to ramp up our enforcement measures. So all these places you are talking about, we're going to have a, a cleanup there. We're going to have a complete soup. We're going to send uh, law enforcement agencies to take a soup of, of that whole stretch. And, and not just there, so many other places, particularly the central region. We're going to do that. You can be rest assured of that, and you can monitor that. As I say, Operation Halt has never been a continuous operation. It's always been a surgical one. And whenever we find that there's, there's a particular place where uh, there's a rise in illegal mining or there's um, uh, a rise in activities and PDT and the rest, we move them in. We're going to do the, conduct the review today and uh, within the next 24 hours, we're going to find the resources and move them. We hear more from the minister on this uh, particular situation and the intervention. He talks about a stakeholder engagement also that will, will be happening shortly. But the managing director of the Ghana Water Company, Evans, we've been hearing from him in our latest hotline documentary, Poisoned River, actually asking government to entrust the military with the responsibility of protecting these endangered waters. And today... We've also been hearing from the convener for the Media Coalition Against Illegal Mining, Dr. Kenneth Ashigbe, backing that particular call. You wonder where we went to sleep, that now by the side of the road, when on the uh, Accra Komasi Road, you can see the Galamse actually happening. You wonder where we want to sleep, where now on the, if you go into all our major uh, water bodies, there are some funds that are sitting on the water body. What has happened to our, uh, uh, you know, the drones that we, we got? You know what now the, the most of these illegal miners do? When they get into this forest, they, they actually jam the area so that you can't even fly a drone into the, uh, into the space. Yesterday, on, uh, we, I was with Evans. The, the, the Water Research Institute, they are not even able to, Water Research Commission, they are not even able to send their people to go and take samples to measure. So, you see, Galamse is a national crisis, but it has local, uh, you know, solutions. Mm. So by now, we should be asking of the DCs, the MCs, the uh, police commanders in these communities, what it is that they are doing. But the media coalition. We are, we are regrouping again, and I we're grateful for, for multimedia especially. That has kept this particular fight going on eh, and up to this particular point. But we are reorganizing, and we're happy that generally now all the media are focusing on this particular issue and raising it up. Next week, we're hoping to have a press conference. Okay. Now we don't want to get other people standing behind us and the media at the forefront. We're calling on, we're going to be calling on labor. We're going to be calling on our chiefs. We're going to be calling on the churches. We all need to come to the front and tell the president that currently the current president is the one in charge. We need to deal with this, the issues of our water bodies. So we, our proposal is that a state of emergency be declared on the water bodies and then the buffers that are concerned. 
So that's uh, the convener of the coalition against illegal mining. Well, uh, you know, uh, can actually be mentioned that he was with me last night. Indeed, he was. We were on PM Express uh, yesterday uh, on the same subject. And a few revelations there. The uh, Water Resources Commission revealed that now the Galamseas are now preventing the scientists who work for the Water Resources Commission from getting close to the river bodies to take samples to test for turbidity. And they have erected barriers with armed men that are now manning the water body. So the, the Galamseas now are policing the water bodies, uh, preventing the officers of the Water Resources Commission from taking the samples uh, to test if the water turbidity is good enough. They are now having to fly drones because the uh, Galamseas are not allowing them to access the water bodies anymore to measure the turbidity based on the color of the river. That's how bad. They're circumventing the Galamseas to do their jobs. And then he also tells us that the prediction that we will run out of uh, treatable water, it had been estimated based on the numbers that it, we, we could reach that point as early as the next decade. He says that can come way earlier than that based on what they're seeing and that the water turbidity levels we're seeing in Ghana is the worst in the world. They haven't seen it anywhere else in the world apart from, say, Southern, uh, the, South America. But even that, it says it's not as widespread in terms of the, the, yeah. the totality of the water body they have there. And that is what uh, he is pointing to as the next crisis. And we also clear that we can't even import water anymore if, if that happens because the uh, our neighboring countries have their water bodies that enter into Ghana. Right, and so it's not like they, they, they're actually now looking at how we can get water to them. So, when that time comes in less than a decade, we cannot go and lay pipes, say to Burkina Faso or Burkina to Ivory well. Coast, mm -hmm. and, and, and ask them to sort of get us water in, into our own land. Listen to Dr. Bob Arthur. You already mentioned some of the figures in terms of the turbidity values. Uh, this is very common across the southwestern area. Uh, you mentioned some of the areas and uh, the picture is very gloomy it is frightening in fact to you know put it bluntly uh, i really hope and uh, like the previous panelists said uh, it is not just about hope but uh, we need to keep doing something to trigger the change that we all need uh, i can tell you it has a cascading effect not only on the water supply but the economy of ghana the lives of people and we have a few group i mean a small group of people who are making millions out of this and to paraphrase what you put as your poisoning people in this country it is heart reckoning to to even think about it and the impudence in which they operate not only within the buffers of the rivers but they operate in the rivers and they have their own personal security to even prevent regulators from taking data of the water to analyze I mean, is that happening to you it yes of course my men go to the ground we, we measure stability values almost every week to see uh, areas that were much better, what is the situation. But there are some specific areas that you can't even have access to. And well, when, you, cannot, when, you say, when you say don't have access to, what, what do you mean? They have barriers, uh, uh, security posts, where you will have to show your credentials or the reason why you have to, you know, access wow. those areas and sometimes we have to navigate our way to be able to get to the river and take samples uh, there are times we have to rely on satellite images using the color of the, the the water we are able to correlate and determine the values of the turbidities and it matches very well with areas where we have direct access that we can actually take samples to the laboratory. So we are all on the same page. And, and, and what you and say, what, what, what you say is not only shocking, it's, you use the word frightening, I want to borrow it. Because now the Galamseas are preventing the scientists hmm. from testing the turbidity of the water. 
Yes. And they're erecting barriers mm -hmm. and making it hard, I, I believe, with threats of harm. Exactly. And uh, sometimes when we persuade them that we are only coming to take samples, but we are not coming to stop them, tell them say, then they may allow us to go and take the samples. But that impudence is beyond imagination, Evans. Mm. We all know the problems. Uh, what we need to do now is to look at the solutions. We have talked about these problems for so many years. And we cannot continue uh, describing the problems all the time. It is beyond imagination. Like the Ghana Water Company official said, stability levels are not even supposed to be more than 500 NTU. And we had that in this country before. We managed the water resources in a way that we had stability levels below 500 meter, uh, uh, NTU. Now we are going beyond 14,000. This would be the worst in the, in the world. There you have it. And this is the acting executive director of the Water Resources Commission saying that our water stability uh, readings and units that we are getting highest in the world. Can you and imagine? That's serious. And did he say that they have to seek permission from these illegal miners to be able to do their work? Yes. Where are they getting this confidence so from? Now Who is empowering them? The water body is there. Yes. So you need permission to access it. And they are beating water company workers amongst others really where is this confidence coming from yeah and it's been reduced to which government was able to pollute the water better than the other interesting let's um touch base with our correspondents on this and the hashtag is hashtag no to galamse and of course erastus asari donko gga journalist of the year has been leading the team on this uh, particular um situation and this campaign well erastus um has gone back to some of the areas he visited last year on this uh, particular situation erastus ping that picture for us so what you're just talking about, um, we found similar uh, things on the Ankobra River. And we spent about four hours on the Ankobra River fact-checking um, claims that the river has cleared up. Now, you find people mining in the middle of the Ankobra River at various points. And they feel that the river belongs to them. One of them we learned on our trail went to a chief and said he wants that portion of the Ankubra River sold to him so he can continue to mine on the river. And we find all these things similar. When you go to the Tamil River, we are just from there about three days ago. You have a mining company full of Chinese nationals that has pegged its washing day wait wait erastus erastus please yeah. give me some clarity you were saying mm. that this illegal miner went to the chiefs asking that part of the ankubra river should be sold to him yes a particular portion wow. of the ankubra river where he he thinks there is so much gold in that area he wants it sold to him to become his property i see yes what else did and you find we went to the tunnel uh, river in Samraboy, and as we speak... And, and Erasmus, just a second. I mean, no wonder we're hearing the Water Resources Commission boss say they are not erecting barriers mm -hmm. to the riverside. Yeah. Because yes. it is possible and, and, that people and there now are believe areas it's theirs. on the river, we found. In fact, um, if you go there to the areas called Awolenzo, uh, Duale, uh, those in the towns along the Azim coast on the Ankubra, there are those who are still mining directly on the riverbed as we speak. But what, what is happening at Samuel Boy is baffling. It's, it's criminal, it's evil. You find Chinese nationals aided by their Ghanaian collaborators and they peg the washing bay at the edge of the Tunnel River and they are washing the mining residue directly into the river. Yeah. And we have those footages uh, we're going to show uh, in our uh, in subsequent days, and and this is this is just evil to to know that this is contaminated stuff, and they are washing it directly into a major river like the Tano. And we are seeing this across the Pra River as well. 
at Chifu Craso, Chifu Kotochi uh, area, sampan machines sitting directly on it. Now the Ofin River in Ashanti region is 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 gone. It's lifeless. The other day we flew the drone, we counted about 300 of the champagne machines sitting directly on it. Those who are mining alongside it and washing their residue directly into the river. With so much impunity, it looks as if they own the resource. And one, one particular chairman of, of a political party I will mention, he told me, in chief, now in Shona Oho Sisiya, and Sisiya, yeah, the and in, in, in translation, currently, what are we doing with the river? Mm. And he wants to tell me that we have to spoil it. At least if we spoil it and get gold for now, uh, it, it will clear up later in future. And that's the mindset of the people who continue to perpetrate some of these nature crimes. I really can't take any more from you, Erastus, on this particular situation. But let's check on the situation in the eastern region. Thank you, Erastus. Kofisian has also been checking on the situation in parts of the eastern region. Kofisian, tell me the situation is better there. MFA, uh, it's a very sorry situation in the eastern region. If you've used the Kumasi, Accra Kumasi Highway, uh, right from a town like Achim, Osino to uh, a place like Asaman Tamfoy and you name and its surrounding areas, you could clearly see that these illegal miners are mining openly in the full glare of everybody. So uh, I'll be surprised that law enforcement agencies and, uh, you know, political uh, power welders will come to deny that uh, they haven't seen anything like that because it, it's open. Everybody sees it when you're, a ve- when you're in a vehicle traveling from uh, Accra to Kumasi. You you see this illegal miners uh, mining along the Accra Kumasi highway. And it, it, it's a very sad situation because uh, one wonders why we all see these illegal miners destroying our water bodies, but uh, no one seems to. Uh, care about about the situation. Uh, Kofi, thank you very much. And yesterday, uh, something else that the Ghana Water Company rep on PMS says, uh, the statement that was issued was about Central Region, Cape Coast, to be very specific. Mm-hmm. He says they're going to issue another statement mm-hmm. uh, about the Western Region because they're having the same issues there and that the plants there are now, they're risking shutdown. Uh, because of the self in the water and that 60 percent of the water that you treat right now in that part of the country is silted so they only have 40 percent to treat for you and after the 40 percent they treat for you you they can only salvage 40 percent of that and that 60 percent they have to throw away because it's no matter how much they spend to purify it it will not be safe for you to drink yeah. so they'll just have to you know waste the 60 percent and 40 percent of what will come through your tap now, the difficulty with that is, if you go to 2022, the Ghana Water told us that that's at the time, if they purify the water, they only get 50% through your taps. Two years on, it's dropped now to 40%. What, what it means that in two years, 10% of the water that we are now trying to purify is no longer able to come to your tap because the Galamsey had made it too dirty for the chemicals to purify for you. So if you've lost... 10 percent in two years and you have and that's the calculation that led to the a decade will we'll be running out in the next eight years on the average now you're losing 10 percent of the water you purify every two years in eight years you would get to a point where when they purify the water they it's wouldn't get anything for you to mm-hmm. run to the top and that's why the ghana water uh, commission the water resources commission is making the point that when you look at the temperature levels if it continues you even have to wait eight years for that to happen and that for the machines they use to purify the 2000 NTU is actually too high for them. They were actually built for 500. And we are now having 14,000 14, mm-hmm. NTU. Uh, so let's go to the Western region where Ina is. And we're expecting to hear from the Ghana Water Company as far as that is concerned. Well, Ina will join us uh, subsequently. Okay, but we can hear uh, from the Speaker of Parliament on this as well as the National House of Chiefs shortly. But this is what Speaker Alban Bagbin said yesterday. The people you are talking to are aware. It's not that they are not aware. They are aware that you are, you are, some of you are participating in it. So please, 
First, desist from doing it yourself. Don't go to them for the money for your campaigns. Don't go to solicit their votes. Let them see you work. Truly, it's a disgrace that we've gone to this far. Look at the water. Horrible. But that is no problem. It's only expensive. Well, annually, the water we get as a country can refill all these rivers. But how do you do away with what has already been polluted and the environment? How do you repair the damage? That is the challenge we have. But God has blessed us with so much water that on an annual basis, we get water, water more than what we have now. So that's a national crisis uh, that uh, we've been talking about. The Galapse menace is back with a vengeance, actually. Mm. And his assertions were validated by the lands minister himself uh, when he uh, came on the Super Morning Show today, indicating that the fight is more often than not hindered by some elements in the opposition and his party as well. Ramp up your enforcement measures, you put in opposition halt, you start to demobilize excavators and burn them, if you want to call them, burn them, uh, or demobilize uh, equipment used for illegal mining. These same elements goes into the communities and tell them, look, when we come into office, we we'll allow you to mine freely, indiscriminately. And this is on tape, it's on video, high-ranking opposition officers on video, on tape. You have another situation where when you ramp up the enforcement regime, then you have elements, some elements, and I say this with qualification, not all, some elements in the ruling party who say, well, the minister is trying to, uh, um, is taking measures which will cost us the elections, uh, the minister's actions is going to result, or the government's action, actions uh, are going to result in, 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 the, in the ruling party losing the elections and this and that. And then the truth also is that you have elements to whom, when you clamp down on them, they will come to you and, and, and make a lot of noise about how the, the party is, is being too draconian on, on its measures against illegal mining. But from where I sit and from where government sit, we do not have to be perturbed by any of those considerations. Well, so that's the Lands and Natural Resources Minister, but of course, we still need answers. That is not enough. Stakeholders' engagement, not enough. What exactly is the next way forward? And the yesterday, hashtag, mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, uh, Ken uh, group, that's the Media Coalition Against Illegal Mining, uh, they indicated they're now mobilizing mm -hmm. and part of the things that we'll be doing, hold the press conference, but secondly, yeah, he hear the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, so they're mobilizing to hear the streets, to demand action from the political uh, duty bearers immediately. They haven't hit the streets in a while, but this one, we're going all out. No, absolutely. Yeah. Now, delayed rings in eight food growing regions have resulted in government's desperate moves to guard against uh, food insecurity. Uh, but agricultural economist Dr. Robert Adu says the impact of drought on food security is only a symptom of the long neglect of irrigation in the country. From Kumasi, Nanaya Ujima brings you today's edition of Climate Focus. Most farmers were expecting their crops to be ready for harvesting in August. Unfortunately, most crops have failed to fruit due to prolonged dry spell, with farmers losing their investment. Dr. Shalom Adodanso, a senior research scientist with Ghana's Forestry Research Institute, explains the vulnerability of farmers to weather changes and climate variability. The temperature is increasing, rainfall is becoming erratic. But now you have a situation where sometimes you have a very intense rainfall, but within a short time, then it can also be accompanied by dry spell um, durations. Agabuga in the Pru East district of the Bono region is among the worst affected communities by the dry spell in the country. We're expecting rains in June and July, but it never came. The maize should be fruiting by now, but it is not. The weather does not support farming. It may lead to shortage of food on the market. Walking through the farm, the soil is dried up. Most of the maize plants here are turning brown from the green leafy ones normally noticed with healthy plants. Jacob Naja weaves through his yam farm as he hopes for the rains. We farm maize and granites as well. They are all not doing well now. This year, we will need the government support to cater for our families. We pray they have pity on us. 
To many farmers, poor irrigation continues to be the bane of productivity. Agriculture economist Professor Robert Edu, however, explains poor implementation of the irrigation program has negatively affected efficiency. The idea was fantastic because if those dams were working, then at least those in those communities will have access to water which they can use to irrigate. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be across so many villages and it was a bit overwhelming. I think that going forward, if government can focus, then within, let's say, a district, if you can even have just four places where you can have irrigation scheme that is working, it will help. Dr. Ado Danso says farmers would also need to diversify their livelihood investments and reduce their exposure to climate risk. Their imprint on climate change is all reduced so that the, the practices that they are doing does not lead to increase in the, in the release of greenhouse gases. So for instance, using different varieties of crops is very important. Cropping at different times, so like crop rotation. These things that in the past, our, our farmers, they know already, but the only thing is that we back it with the science. Few months to the 2024 general elections, the two leading political parties who have played active roles in governance are proposing solutions in their manifestos. For Joy News, Nanaya Chima Bono East. And Climate Focus on Joy News is brought to you by Youth Bridge Foundation and Climate and Development Knowledge Network. Another edition of Climate Focus will come your way same time next week. It's time for business. George Riafe is here. You're getting ready for the demonstration against illegal mining. Definitely. Uh -huh. Well, coming up in business, Minister of Public Enterprises advocates for privatization of ECG to address pricing and revenue challenges. And Bank of Ghana looks at tight monetary policy and fiscal consolidation to help us sustain the city's good run. The Business News on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the New World to Build Business. Synthes Tanks and Pepsodent, Hebal and Chaco. Welcome back to Business on Newsnight. Now, the Bank of Ghana has revealed that it will stay on that path of a tight monetary policy in the coming weeks to help sustain the city's recent recovery. There is more in this report. The revelation could mean that the Bank of Ghana will still go ahead with measures that will help maintain tight liquidity on the market. This could result in some policy rate hikes in the coming months to help control the amount of money in circulation. The Bank of Ghana believes that this move may go a long way to ensure we don't have too much CDs in circulation that could fuel dollar purchases as some individuals may take steps to hedge against inflation. The central bank also believes that this approach of the tight monetary policy will help in bringing down inflation rate on the market, which has been on the downward path in recent times. The Bank of Ghana is also looking forward to government pressing ahead with policy measures to control its expenditure and raise the required revenue that will also help in dealing with confidence issues about the economy. The Bank of Ghana is also signaling that it is committed to improve dollar support for the market through its auction programs. It believes these measures should help sustain the recent gains made by the Ghana City. And that is a business tax report. Now, businesses and consumers are not that optimistic about the outlook of the economy. Now, that's according to the latest consumer confidence survey released by the Bank of Ghana. Now, this has been influenced by the high food prices and concerns about the outlook of the economy going forward. Now, this is despite assurances from government that it will be prudent with expanding this year to help contain the budget deficit and overruns. Meanwhile, economist Dr. Pillar. Dr. Prisler Chimisi Bafo maintains that a lot more needs to be done to stabilize the city to deal with the concerns of businesses. The sustenance of the exchange rate, um, I will say that it means we need to limit the extent to which we are dependent on imports. And so, for example, um, are there conversations, are there attempts for us to, for instance, produce a lot of the things that are not... Um, a very important yet imported into the country. We know that yes, some classes of imports, there's nothing we can do because we do not have the expertise. I believe that as a country, we should get um, back to basics and produce some of these things to ease the persistence uh, on the city. Economist Dr. Priscilla Chumesi Bafo.
Now, the Minister of Public Enterprise, Joseph Kujo, is making a strong case for the privatization of the District Company of Ghana to deal with losses when it comes to power sold and also some enhancing of efficiency. The minister maintained that pricing issues and also impacting it badly going forward with respect to the operations and also the impact of the foreign exchange losses. He believes that going this way may go a long way to deal with the challenges facing the company. He made these remarks on the sidelines of the Ghana Gas 2024 roundtable discussion in Accra. Are we able to make that key decision that the service delivered by ECG is an economic service? For that matter, ECG pays is supposed to pay dollar bills or generation when it comes to power generation in the country. What goes into it by way of fuel and equipment and everything? Dollar base and then against a CD revenue which is subject to depreciation and we are not doing what I would call right pricing. If ECG were a private company, looking at its own circumstances, it would be very easy to manage. Joseph Kujo is the Minister for Public Enterprises. The government has justified the proposed 1,000 Ghana city as compensation for farmers affected by the dry spell in some parts of the country. It follows criticisms that the proposed support does not even meet a quarter of their investment cost. But the Greek minister, Brani Champon, insists the money is part of a total package the government is working to extend to these farmers. I'm saying that I'm going to give you all the seeds that you require to replant. So everything that you lost in terms of maize seed, improved maize seed, and fertilizer, I'm going to give it to you. That in itself, okay, is about 4,000 Ghana cities per acre. I am also going to give you 1,000 Ghana cities in addition. I am going to give you food grants because when you harvest, you are supposed to keep it for one year. If you put that together... That is not 1,000 Ghana cities. Mm. You realize that the government actually or maybe punching above his body weight. Brian Champon is the Minister of Agri. Let's turn our attention to the stock market and persons that have invested in the market from January to now have made a return of almost 39% higher than comparing it to treasury bills and other investment instruments on the market. And that's all uh, for business on Newsnight. We do some of your messages um, that you've sent in via WhatsApp. And um, um, I'll go through um, some of them uh, quickly. And this one here says the Galamse fight requires a concerted effort rather than leaving it to the government to fight it, which at the end of the day, NDC members are also on the ground edging them on. So that's Nana Ekwiamwa Mwating Ablikuma Central. We're hoping that this politics is sickening, uh, this politics about Galamse and who did it best and who did not do it well. Really, really sickening. Stephen in Tema says, how do the president and the subordinates feel when um, they watch the TV and listen to the radio report of the hams Galamse is doing to this country? He has seriously filled us and uh, the generations to come. Mm. And um, this one from Nana, Spintex Road. we we'll take that. Uh, I have uh, Douglas, rather, okay. uh, in, in, in my list. And Douglas says, uh, since we live in a country where laws do not work, and people simply do not obey what the law says. How can, how on earth is Ghana Water Company now asking permission from the Galamseas? And well, it's not the Ghana Water Commission, it's the, it's the um, Water Resources Commission mm -hmm. that is now asking permission uh, from the Galamseas. Is this serious? Why can't any government stand firm to fight the Galamse or the Galamse? Uh, people are uh, they saying they're stronger than a government let a military take forces into the uh, forest he says Douglas centers that one and the next message says um, did we hear another prayer comparing NDC and NPP the contamination of our rivers such a okay please as uh, citizens aren't interested in who is overdone or who is polluting our waters currently our rivers are muddy and NPP is in power and we want them to be honorable as they claim to be and Daniel Kutswati uh, from East Ligon says, in fact, Ghana has lost the fight against Galamse. No amount of words will change that. It's only God who can save us from this situation. It is not God. It is you and I.
Well, the Ghana Education Service has instituted a two-week investigation into incidents that led to the stabbing and killing of an 18-year-old final year student of the O'Reilly Senior High School here in Accra. The deceased Edward Bokete Saki was alleged to have been involved in an argument and scuffle with a colleague student who allegedly stabbed him multiple times in the chest. According to reports, he was uh, rushed to the Lekma Hospital where he was reported dead. Now, Director General of the Ghana Education Service today led a delegation to commiserate with the family, assuring that the matter will be dealt with. The GS has just released a statement, and my colleague James Abadji is here with details of this. What is the GS saying? Yes, Evan. So, this is issued by the PR department and it says that uh, they hope to conclude their administrative investigations within two weeks while the police service handles the criminal investigation. Uh, the GAS says it is pleased to report that calm has been restored to uh, the campus of the school and they are working to ensure the well-being and safety of all students and staff. Uh, the GS remains committed to providing a secure and conducive learning environment for all students and will continue to work tirelessly to prevent such incidents and ensure the safety of student and academic work on all campuses. They also go on to uh, urge the public to refrain from speculations and allow the investigative process to unfold and provide updates uh, as they deem necessary when it is available, signed by the PRO of the Education Service. Uh, we've been hearing from the father of the deceased. Yes, he spoke to the media right after the engagement with the Ghana Education Service. He says they will give the GS the uh, time they want to uh, use for the investigations. If after that uh, justice is not delivered, they may take a legal action against the Ghana Education Service. I want to give them um, the benefit of the doubt with what they are, how do you call it, what did he say, the man, uh, they are, Eric and Kansan, the, the Eric, Director General, the Director General said, mm -hmm. I want to give him the benefit, the, the benefit of the doubt, that we should give him two weeks, the family is going to hear from them. Mm -hmm. So we want the family want to hold on for that two weeks and hear what they'll come out with. If they don't come out with anything reasonable, I think we'll take the legal action against them. Yeah, according to what he said, he said the school have rules, but everything will go um, under uh, two weeks. The school will do the investigation, what caused all these problems, together with the police. Okay, fine. It's law, so we have to give them that chance for them to do all their investigations to know what caused the death of my son? So uncomfortable. I'm, 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 I'm so mad now. Mm. So much in pain. I'm not expecting this. It has happened. Meanwhile, the municipal chief executive for Lejo Kuku, Modikai Kwashi, says while investigations are ongoing into the case, steps are being taken to ensure safety of teachers and students following that protest from residents. Clearly, there are security issues with the school that we need to take care of in order to empower the school to take charge of security and the discipline. So the first actions we will take will relate to these two things. Immediately we are going to also the home of the deceased young man to go and uh, um, solidarize with the family and express our sympathy and condolences. Our purpose right now is to calm things down and reduce the, the, the detentions so that the students can finish their exams in, in peace. We also will reassure the family that uh, their investigations are ongoing and that the truth will be established in relation to all what they have heard. You can imagine how traumatic an event this is for students who are writing exams. Indeed, some wrote exams immediately after the event. Your guess is as good as mine in what state of mind the students would have been in. And so counseling is ongoing to help them to, to deal with the trauma of this event. So it, it, is, it is ongoing. So that's the MC for the area and we await the outcome of this particular investigation that has been instituted by the Ghana Police Service. Let's do sports. Musbal, what do we have? Hello, well, uh, the 2025 African Cup of Nations qualifier Black Stars in action tomorrow again is Angola at the Bavara Sports Stadium and ahead of that head coach 
Otoado has been speaking and he's issued a strong warning to his players to avoid underestimating the opponent as they prepare for the game. He believes that the Angolans are a very strong side. However, he's also confident in his team's chances in the game tomorrow. Ramp up your... You can keep ministers and members of parliament out. First of all, um, yes, with this coach, and it's going to be very, very tough. Um, if you see the la their last results, um, also playing against Cameroon, a draw. Um, they lost only by one goal to Nigeria, one goal to Morocco. Then you can see what quality this, this team has. Uh, so it won't be easy for us. We have got good players as well, very good players. So I'm convinced that we can beat them, but it won't be easy. Um, and also we had some, yeah, some injuries. Um, but um, I think um, the squad is ready. We have uh, a lot of players who can, who can match up and, and the rest. So we have more um, um, which are injured. Um, I wish them uh, a speed recovery. And then we see how the season goes um, when they can come back. Well, that's Otto Ado there. And apologies for the earlier sound there. Well, the head coach for the Angolan side is already... Uh, raising concerns about officiating, uh, he says that Ghana did benefit from some what he describes as uh, unfortunate officiating in the last game against Central Africa Republic, and his side is wary of that, but charging the officials to be bold despite the very strong atmosphere they will be under at the Varaspo Stadium. I care because everybody watched the, the last matches. And uh, even the last match uh, again against the RCA. If you ask me the name of the referees, I, I don't know. But uh, for sure, uh, we are worried about because in the last match, uh, a lot of things happened um, for, for Ghana. <laughs> yeah, for sure, it's important the referee be brave and courage about the atmosphere for tomorrow. Congaf is there, the head coach for the Angolan side. Even that's for sports. The game is at 4 p.m. tomorrow at the Bavaria Sports Stadium. And thank you very much, Ms. Bauer. So live your news tonight is on Joy 99.7 FM. Now only on traders who relocated from Agugloshi to Ajin Kotoku. Others morning raising concerns about the uh, westening plight since the uh, relocation three years ago of the poor nature of the road by Ajin Kotoku. Low customer turnout and inadequate infrastructure, among others, is making it difficult for them to thrive in their new location, forcing some of them to return to the Agugloshi market. My colleague Sweetie Abochi spent some time with the traders and filed this report. The onion market here at Ajin Kutuku is a lively hive of activity. As trucks unload sack loads of onions to be distributed to intermediaries, wholesalers and retailers. But in the midst of the hustle and the bustle, stories unfold. First, I spoke with Alhaji Masawudu, the chairman of the Onion Sellers Association at Ajin Kutuku. He expressed that while the new location is manageable, there are three critical challenges hindering their progress here. Okay. We have sanitation problem, we have bad route, and then the petroleum that's the, the three main issue. I mean, uh, when we are talking about the route, it's a big problem, a big issue. Uh, from the main route, they are doing the route. And if you reach mid year, from mid year to Ajin Kotoku, that's the worst problem. And if you reach from three junction to Ajin Kotoku, that's the worst problem. And then right now, all the trucks pass through uh, mid year to this place. Some of the trucks get spoiled through uh, uh, the mid year route to Ajin Kotoku. We often go and find a towing car from a uh, police yeah to tow this truck to here because uh, if they are passing you will see uh, the, the shafts and then the springs and then the, every time you pass there you will see a broken car on the road. one day you see there is no truck if the women come and buy they don't have a car to take them to their destination instead of we will have uh, eight trucks yesterday all of them spoil on the road all of them. All of them spoiled the road. So we have three trucks. So 
the remaining will bind with today's one. And then they will come. You see the petrol rate will come. Patronage. The petrol rate is simply because of the bad road. People are coming. But if you come here today, you won't come tomorrow. Because uh, how the car will shake you and then everything and then... Meet Forgive, Dinah and Mercy, three onion sellers from Dodoa and Adam who regularly buy sacks of onions at wholesale prices here and retail them in their communities. Their experiences as regular buyers at Ajin Kutuku are a mixed bag. Baby, I had to say, because when you saw I think the market at Abibushi was far better than here because it was a more centralized place for onions. That means more trucks, more onions at relatively lower prices. Now it is more like survival of the fittest, so we are the ones suffering. We are only appealing that the roads be fixed because it will fix most of our problems. Yes. At Agbogloshi, we could get a bag of onions for 300 cities because it was more centralized. But because of the roads and the resultant increment here, we get a bag of onions for 1,500 cities. From 300 cities to 1,500 cities? 1,000, 7,000, 8,000 now. I almost almost bet me 100. 800, 700. They say, say From the drivers, the very pivotal role in this whole value chain, the people who transport the onions to and from here at Ajen Kutuku. Loading things from here to Takwa and other places is such a terrible experience. The potholes are death traps, especially from media to this place. If you are not lucky, you will need to repair four springs by the end of the journey. Meanwhile, spare parts are so expensive. By the end of the week, you are either buying a tire or spring. Sometimes when the cargo trucks break down, we have to go and bring in the goods. Maybe beyond two hundred they are necessary. Say some go back and say no. The best best time I am because as I said, no one man find the baby. And they are how and they are brave and so there. And there is better. Well, that's my colleague Sweetia Bochi's interaction with traders and drivers at the Ajin Kutuku market. The MC for the area, Clement Wilkinson, says the challenge will be resolved soon. That road has been given to. A contractor and the contractor have done a lot within the township which Adiankotoku, the people of Adiankotoku is aware of what the contractor is doing but the, the main road has to be asphalt road so we 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 are trying to do something like a two lane a two two here two here so that was that is the design that we we are, we are asking them to do now as we speak but because with immediate action that people are are in need of that road, we have asked the contractor to do the single lane that has been given to him. And the vice president was there last week. He said it to the people of Ajin Kutuku because there is a, a children's hospital which has been built, and he was there for inspection. And very soon they will finish. So he asked myself and the regional minister to speed up on that Ajin Kutuku road. And that's the MC for the area. Let's get into the election headquarters. Election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosol Platinum Energy, Energizing Dreams, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, SIMA, and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, AICPA, together as the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, German Ozon Medical Center, Alternative Therapy, Dental, Wellness and Beauty, Chop Box Technologies, a convenient service, and Youth Bridge Foundation, bridging the gap for positive youth development. <laughs> Another campaign trail uh, tonight.
Bamia has been touring the uh, Okanko constituencies here in the Greater Crow region and set to address a rally. Uh, also, uh, we know that uh, in the Bono uh, East region, Flagbury of the NDC, uh, John Mahama continues his four day tour and has been mocking government, especially the lack of rainfall. And as a bit, has been following him. John Dramani Mohammed's Bono East tour began with a mini rally with the chiefs and people of Amoma in the Kintampo South constituency where he used the opportunity to outline some key messages in the party's 2024 Resetting Ghana Manifesto. Our manifesto includes provisions for every region with plans to allocate large tracts of land for factories. private businessman. Some of this land will be offered to private entities, which will in turn create jobs for everyone in the region. And we know that Dr. Um, Hassan Ayariga, the APC's Dr. Hassan Ayariga, also has a running mate today, uh, Dr. Wolasi Mensa. Already he's been firing both the NPP and the NDC. And now to the camp of the CPP also, the party has retained Nana Sapongkumankuma as the flag bearer. Well, the PNC is also getting ready for its Congress. Already it suffered an injunction. That and more will bring you subsequently. And that's how we wrap up news night tonight. Strong and sassy. Hi, Emma. Hi. What's up? What are Happy we talking Happy school about fees week <laughs> um, to you guys. I don't know if it's this week or next week for you. you guys, minus you. Eh? I'm suddenly sick. No, because it's not a happy week. Can't you tell? It's, it's not easy on this oh, side of sorry. Accra. Evans, you can, you're can. feeling my pain. Eh? I can feel your pain. Thank you very much. Because I'm feeling it too. Charlie, Charlie, it's very tight. Anyways, um, we're talking about insecurity in relationships. Have you mm. ever dated somebody who has insecurity issues? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Was it horrible? Oh, it's horrible. Do you think it was your fault? Absolutely not. Do you think that you could have done something to make it better? No. Hmm? Wow. No. Why not? You don't you don't feel like your behavior maybe was given some sort of Ab vibes? Absolutely not. So you think it was just all hair? All hair. I mean, all in her head. There's really nothing you can do when somebody feels insecure. But sometimes when you try harder, hmm. that actually then becomes another avenue to sort of reinforce insecurity. There's a question, why all of a sudden, why are you doing that you didn't do it before? Okay, you can't well, win. I, I completely disagree with you, but I mean, anyway, stay tuned in. We're talking about insecurity in relationships. Are you, have you been in an insecure relationship? I have been insecure in a relationship Have you before. felt insecure yourself? Um, I don't feel insecure on my own. And then I was in a relationship and I realized that the insecurity is actually not my fault. It's actually because people... Who was being insecure? You or... The time that I was, yeah. But because people people are just funny and, and sometimes men give up mixed signals and funny vibes and all sorts of things. You know? So it's, I, it's a bit complex. I'm looking forward to hearing your story on this one. You won't hear my story. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. But anyway, all that and more coming up next on Strong and Sassy.